So this leaves questions. The Biden administration is currently um, crafting their next cyber strategy. Are we going to see more of the Obama administration rehash? Are we going to see a Trump rehash? Or are we going to find that there are some continuities from both Obama and Trump? And I think where there are questions is in four main areas. One is kind of what are the role of norms and how prominently is it going to play in strategy? The second is deterrence. Does deterrence matter in cyber and should it be a huge part of the strategy? The third is escalation. Assumptions about escalation shape almost all of US cyber strategy. And then the fourth and fifth are about public-private relationships and the role of trust. Cyber is more fizzled than bang. So how do you build a strategy for something that is constantly fizzling? Very important, but you don't see big bang effects. And I think that's gonna be the challenge for the Biden administration. So on the first question about norms, is cyberspace the wild, wild west? I'm gonna argue here, no. There are two norms that are emerged, one emerged and one second emerging. The first norm that has emerged is that cyber operations do not lead to violent retaliation. This means that states, like China, are going to be more likely to conduct cyber operations to steal information because they don't worry that someone's going to bomb them because of it. That's bad news. On the good news side, um, states aren't worried that this is going to lead to war, so that's good. The second norm that's developing is that um, it is inappropriate to target civilian infrastructure. And we see this actually occurring through the UNGGE, but also um, there seems to be some sort of restraint that's occurring from the Russians. Um, and the United, the United States needs to think in its future cyber strategy whether it should be an advertent policy entrepreneur for this norm um, and actually have a, a declared restraint policy that it will not target critical infrastructure. So that's a debate that's occurring right now. The second question is about deterrence. The Obama administration really focused on deterrence in all of its strategies, um, but there's been significant academic research. Um, I've worked a lot in war games and experiments to try and see whether cyber deterrence really works. And the reality is that um, cyber deterrence is not effective for the vast majority of cyber operations that occur today. So the ransomware activity, the criminal activity, the spying, deterrence is not an appropriate frame. But there might be a role for cyber deterrence when it comes to nuclear strategic impacts, right? So how do we deter someone like Russia from conducting an attack against US uh, nuclear command control and communications? And that's the type of um, strategic target that we actually have credible deterrence by punishment options. So there is a role for deterrence in strategy, but it's probably a limited role. Um, the big question I think that's happening right now in the Biden administration is whether we can talk about deterrence by denial, which is creating um, both defense and resiliency to convince adversaries that it's not worth taking significant cyber attacks. Um, and that's where in the past it's kind of been a hand wave in strategy, but we'll probably see more of it in the coming strategy. And then there's a big question about whether cyber operations can be used as a signal or as a tool for deterrence. Are these useful? If you read um, a, a lot of work in like the Washington Post, you'll see that a lot of journalists are concerned about cyber operations being used for signaling and it leading to escalation to war. Um, academic research shows that these are actually not effective uh, signals for deterrence and that future strategies should probably avoid including them as a major tool for deterrence. And then the big question that has been in the last two administrations was whether cyber operations was going to lead to escalation. So this was the big concern under the Obama administration was that this would turn into cyber Pearl Harbor. And this uh, cover is actually uh, from right at the beginning of the Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict. So there was a lot of fear at the beginning of that conflict that cyber operations were gonna turn in this into a nuclear war. Uh, it turns out the Russians were just gonna do war Anyway, they, the cyber stuff was more of a, a side gig. And so I think what we found is that um, cyber really doesn't serve as a deliberate escalation mechanism, um, but it's also probably not something that's causing peace in the world, which is an argument that's put out by some academics. Instead, what we're seeing is that cyber operations have a constant relationship with violence, not to incite violence, um, but instead um, to increase the information control, to see who has the most information um, 
so they can figure out who to target, how they get support from international organizations, um, and then how to degrade confidence in institutions. And I think that's kind of where we see the largest strategic impact of cyber, is in its ability not to act as a bomb, but instead to act as a termite, where it's actually eating at the foundations of the trust that we have in the digital components of society. And that really brings me to kind of looking ahead, right? So the, the Biden administration is currently working on their next cyber strategy. So I think this cyber strategy needs to focus very much on the role of trust. So the true impact of cyber operations is not on uh, whether a nuclear bomb works or not. It's whether we believe cyber operations have effect on whether a nuclear bomb works or not. The big effect that cyber operations have is on our trust. The tr can we trust the, the digital technologies, the zeros and the ones that, are in our, that underline our bank accounts, that underline digital currencies? Can we trust the, the digital, uh, the, there is security in those digital resources? Can we trust our digital weapons? Can we trust that we know the right targeting information? That the information that's displayed or that AI ML uses to process for common operating pictures and situational awareness is the actual true depiction. This is where cyber really matters because it degrades the trust that we've built that we need to have in order to combat um, and fight modern conventional wars. And then I think what we've seen from 2018 on is that cyber operations can actually have a real large effect in the trust in digital governance and the trust that societies have in each other. Whether that's because of information operations, um, the balkanization of social media and the creation of enclaves of individuals, or, and this is kind of the not sexy part, you know, all of our information, whether it's our marriage certificates, death certificates, our taxes, they're all now digitally held. And if you can't trust that digital information, what does that mean for local governance? Um, how does the ability to be able to trust that our information is held by governments, um, how does that relate to like, the basic things that we do within our local uh, societies? So we have, to deal, we have to create a strategy that deals with cyber operations that act more like termites than bombs. And as a homeowner, I can tell you that it's not fun to invest in those kind of foundational, boring things. But strategy has to be able to deal with those things or the US uh, is going to fail in cyberspace. I've kind of hand-waved the very complicated relationship that occurs here between the public and the private. The vast majority of cyber attacks occur against private companies, and yet how do we share information between private companies and the US government and vice versa? And what should the authorities and the roles be for the US government? Do we want US military on private networks? What is, should the relationship between, be between the US military, DHS, the National Guard, and our election infrastructure? These are actually extremely complicated political questions. Um, and that's something that has not been completely worked out in previous strategies. And I think finally, for a strategy to be um, successful, they really have to think about how do you implement and operationalize resiliency and trust. These are increasingly becoming buzzwords, but a good strategy identifies how different agencies actually go about implementing these things and what measures of effectiveness could be. And right now, the US is not at that point. So that is kind of the, the future of strategy. That's my kind of my polemic going out to you. So with that, I know I've spent a lot of time talking up here. I want to open this up for question and answer so we can talk about um, the really interesting part of the 10 decades of US cyber strategy. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask, what do you think is the role of research, research institutions and universities in um, educating cadres for cybersecurity and creating good strategies? Yeah, I actually think academia has played an extremely large role in building out these strategies. And um, if you're working in government, you have bureaucratic interests when you're developing a cyber strategy, a policy, legislation, and not a lot of time to validate your assumptions. So I worked uh, for Cyber Command for a while as a reservist in my other hat. Um, and so I was you know, the officer in charge of figuring out how you write, implement deterrence. 
Well, it turns out it was, um, it was more about this complicated um, balancing of these different organizations that were vying for power. Academia, we don't have that problem, right? So I can sit on a problem for multiple years. I can generate data. I can evaluate data. And I can say, hey, these assumptions that you're going in with, empirically, I don't have proof for them. And that's actually what happened with escalation. So if you look at the last two strategies, there were strong assumptions about cyber escalation um, that was really limiting the way the US government used its cyber resources. So scholars became interested. Um, I ran war games for um, the first series for three years. I ran survey experiments. I conducted interviews. I did historical case analyses. And I said, hey, actually, my data shows actually very limited evidence of cyber escalation. And I wasn't the only one. There were academics um, at West Point, at um, Marine Corps University, at Georgetown, at Harvard, all doing different evaluations of different types of data. Um, and then we, you know, there, kudos to the US government and Cyber Command, they actually brought all the academics together and we said, here, here is all of our research about cyber escalation. And then that informed um, the Trump administration's cyber strategy and some of the changes and assumptions about cyber escalation. So I think academia has the ability to stare at a problem for a long time evaluate data, and then um, help policymakers um, and folks who are learning about strategy to evaluate their assumptions. Um, and I think the other thing that academia can do is sometimes um, show government um, where it has its own biases and say, ah, I see that you've done this, but you know, let me, I, I think this is because you're trying to increase the amount of budget you have. You know? um, and that's something that I think academia does a really good job of. Uh, Ma'am, you alluded to some of it, uh, but I was wondering if you could expound a little bit further. Sorry, I'm right here. Okay, sorry. Um, in talking about the kind of emerging norm of the non-targeting mm. of civilian infrastructure, um, where is that line starting to be drawn, specifically when we start talking about dual use or the potential for dual use, and how does that then complicate the policy discussions of like the inability to mobilize National Guard cyber forces over state lines, the inability to mobilize against like somebody attacking Amazon web servers, yeah. even though that, that houses Yay. military data, like the dual use line is very fu fuzzy. So seeing how that then scopes and scales into the public private relationship, I was wondering if you could just expound a little further. Yeah, and I think what, what, this is a really, really good question, especially your example about the Amazon Web Services. Um, because Amazon, you would think of as a traditionally civilian, I don't think people would even think of that as a defense industrial based company. Um, and there are not clear rules about how it houses government information versus how it houses private information. So for those of you who don't know, the cloud is a real place. <laughs> it's usually like a warehouse full of uh, like servers, right? And so you could actually physically have information that is sensitive or government stored in the same geographic location as uh, your photos from spring break vacation. Um, and so there, that creates an actual dual use target that is a legitimate target actually um, in cases of conflict. So this is an emerging question. I think that question will continue to be worked out. It's nowhere near uh, a norm where people can agree on what is, what is civilian and not. But there are other lines where I think people can agree, healthcare. <laughs> uh, I think states are increasingly um, agreeing that healthcare is a place that should be off limits. That said, criminal actors are, are propagating ransomware attacks against um, hospital systems at, at a rate we've never seen before. But there are increasingly um, understandings, even between China, Russia, and the United States, that that's not appropriate, and that that wouldn't be an appropriate um, state target. Power, not so much, right? That's seen as more of a dual use. Um, and so I think there are kind of implicit norms that are developing about what would be considered like truly, truly um, off, um, true in civilian only infrastructure. And then there are states that I think will manipulate and will intentionally entangle in order to decrease the incentives for states to attack. Um, but that's, the, I think, the next stage of the norm. 
um, you see when norms emerge, you have kind of a big idea and then you have a refinement of the idea. I think where we are is at the big idea that in general, there's this idea that targeting civilians is bad. Um, and then how that actually, can it actually get implemented um, in a more explicit way? That will be the refinement of the idea. Hi, um, oh, it's probably Sands. Hi, good morning. I wanted to thank you for your time. And my question delves more deeper in terms of your perspective on education policy. In the sense of, for many students in the United States, typically it's taught with just regular programming, but not necessarily teaching students how to hack. In mm -hmm. order for us to engage with other countries in the next 20 years, do you believe that we should have more hacking courses for students? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so this is a pretty big initiative um, uh, coming out of the National Cyber Director's Office. Uh, a man named Chris Inglis is running that. I worked on this actually for part of the Cyberspace Solarium. Um, is we need to build the workforce. There's, I said, 40,000 Chinese hackers, and the US has like a lot less. <laughs> um, and some of that comes down to um, an underinvestment in STEM. Um, and so the US government has some burgeoning um, policies and burgeoning programs that are supposed to invest, especially at the lower levels, um, the K through 12, into um, increasing just basic liter digital literacy. Um, I, I, I like programs that, that invest in that broadly. As you all know, like lang programming languages change, the technical characteristics change, but investing broadly in that in K through 12 is important. The other thing that the US government is invested in, and there's an, an NSA, National Security Agency program, that um, provides incentives for uh, colleges and universities to have different um, cybersecurity uh, courses, course accreditation. Um, and the idea then is to propagate the amount of cybersecurity majors that there might be, um, starting from community colleges. Um, and then on the final end, and this is kind of something that's being developed, is you know more funding and resources into top universities to be able to develop more programs at places like Stanford, um, Carnegie Mellon. Um, the problem that some of these kind of top graduate programs have had has been talent. So there's been not enough coming through the K through 12 that are American. So we have um, uh, kind of a, a talent problem. And then the other problem the United States has, we have very strict and kind of arbitrary rules about clearances. And so even when we educate folks and we create talent, it's then hard to bring them into the US government because there are so many restrictions on um, who can get a clearance. <laughs>